Hello everybody, I'm your instructor Dave Cacciarella and this is chapter 12 from Essentials of Meteorology, the 7th edition, An Invitation to the Atmosphere, written by C. Donald Ahrens and again chapter 12 is on global climate. Now we've talked a lot about atmospheric science, the composition of the atmosphere, relative humidity, instability, fronts, some bits into weather forecasting, now we've also talked about tropical systems and thunderstorms. Now we want to talk about the climate, the climate that you enjoy, not the weather today, but the weather over a long period, averaged over a long period. And how do we get the different climate types that we have on planet Earth? Where do those climate types or where can you find those climate types? And then once we have classified different climate types, we'll move on to chapter 13 and we'll talk a little bit about climate and climate change. So we've talked a lot about meteorology and atmospheric science, why the weather happens, a little bit about how you can forecast the weather and understanding different atmospheric processes. Now we want to tie some of those larger concepts together to explain why different parts of the globe actually have the different climate types that they do have. So there are three to four basic climate types. Of course, the very bottom of this list there is the global climate, the climate of the entire Earth, and as we've told you in this class, on average, the Earth's temperature is about 59 degrees to 60 degrees Fahrenheit, just the perfect temperature uh, for uh, Earth to have life. But in terms of the specific climates on the globe, uh, there is the microclimate, the mesoclimate, and the macroclimate. And no surprise, the micro is the very, very small the meso is the middle and the macro is the larger. So the microclimate is a very, very small climate, very near to the ground in a very, very small zone where the properties of the surface are, are, are very consistent, uh, where they don't change a whole lot. And um, maybe a city park or an airport tarmac or maybe a clearing in a forest. Uh, and uh, because a much greater extreme and daily air temperature exists near the ground than several feet above ground level, and that goes back to chapter three, uh, then we know this microclimate for very small plants is far more harsh than what the thermometer in that area might show, meaning at the very surface, at the ground, you may have a much larger range in temperatures uh, because, again, the earth heats from below and cools from below. Now, the mesoclimate, when you think about a, a small area of the Earth's surface, we're looking at the mesoclimate, uh, and that could include conditions across a region such as a forest, a valley, a beach, or a town. Uh, the climate uh, of even a bigger area, like a large state or a small nation, would be considered a macroclimate, and the climate extending over the entire Earth is oftentimes re referred to as a global climate, and of course we're talking about a global climate change at this time in our history. So what are the the controls of climate, the factors that produce the climate in any given place are climatic controls. Climatic controls are the same that produce our day-to-day -day weather. So they're not different, they're the same, essentially latitude, north or south in the equator, where of course the equator is warm and the poles are very cold. Land and water and the distribution of land and water and the fact that land and water heat up and cool off at different rates helps to control the climate. Ocean currents certainly control the climate where warmer ocean currents moving from the equator toward the poles will take warm water north or south and therefore help to modify temperatures at northern latitudes like Great Britain. Not necessarily a warm place but not nearly as cold as other land masses at the same latitude because the Gulf Stream brings warm water. In the same way California's coastline is very cold because the California current comes from the poles and moves south and therefore cools things off in San Francisco in the summertime. Prevailing winds and pressure areas are certainly climate controls. Mountain ranges create barriers to weather and barriers to the movement of air and temperature that create climate controls. And even altitude, sometimes referred to as altitudinal zonation, the change in the type of climate that you have as you go up a mountainside. All right, let's look at a map of the world. This map shows the global temperatures at sea level and the global temperatures run in east-west isotherm so iso meaning the same therms referring to temperature and they tend to bend due to land heating and to cooling and to ocean currents and upwelling so well, what we mean by that is uh, we can see that as pretty typical you'd expect right along the equator you have the highest average temperatures all right 
but where the counterclockwise flow in the southern hemisphere of the ocean currents bring cool water from the South Pole north, you have a bending of this isotherm to the north, and so you'll get cooler temperatures along the west coast of South America. And the same goes because of the clockwise flow of the ocean in the North Pacific, you have the bending of isotherms south, where cooler water creates cooler temperatures further south. And then the opposite, as I've already talked about, the Gulf Stream comes out of the Gulf of Mexico and, and on up past North America, past the Outer Banks, and then moves over toward the Great Britain area, taking warmer water over there. And you see those isotherms are bending to the north. So very typical global temperatures running east-west, exactly how you'd expect, warm at the equator and cold at the poles, and then bending due to land heating and cooling, ocean currents, and also upwelling. And upwelling is when the water is moving along from south to north, or moving along from north to south. The, the water current will tend to pull away from the coastline and draw colder water up from below. That's known as upwelling, chilling this area. Now we also know that global partic or I should say global precipitation is most abundant where air rises, that's low pressure, and it's least abundant where air sinks, that is going to be high pressure. So what does that look like? Well, if we take the Earth and we break it down from the equator and the center to 30 degrees south and 30 degrees north, 60 degrees south and 60 degrees north in the North Pole and the South Pole. We know that at the equator where it's warmer, air is rising at the intertropical convergence zone. The, the uh, northeast trade winds, the southeast trade winds are converging. That's the sea. And the warm, moist air here wants to rise. And in this region of the globe, all seasons are wet. And then just north of that strip along the equator, we have a climate where you have a wet summer, but a dry winter and then a wet summer and a dry winter. And then as we move along in this sequence, again, remember, in the three-cell model of the atmosphere, the, the global atmospheric circulation, that at 30 degrees north latitude and at 30 degrees south latitude, air was sinking, and that creates the subtropical high. So the equatorial low, the ITCZ convergence, convergence of the surface meaning low pressure, air is rising, and then air is sinking at the subtropical highs at 30 degrees north and south latitude, creating a situation where all seasons are dry on both sides of the equator. In between it's a wet summer and dry winter, and then all seasons wet, and then all seasons dry. We take that further and just south of 60 degrees north latitude and just north of 60 degrees south latitude, the air coming down from the North Pole, the very, very cold air moving south, converges with the westerlies. And at that convergent zone, we get the polar front at both sides of the globe. And that polar front creates regions of uplift. And we get an area right south of and along 60 degrees north and 60 degrees south, so just north of 60 degrees south, where all seasons are wet because you have this constant uplift just like here at the equator this is thermally driven and to some degree driven by convergence of the northeast and southeast trade winds but at the polar front mechanically this air is being lifted along that frontal boundary creating an all seasons wet situation and then of course finally at the polar highs of the very cold north pole and south pole the air is sinking creating all seasons dry and that north and south pole actually really being the world's greatest deserts now we think of the South Pole, Antarctica is being snow covered, but it doesn't mean there's much precipitation. It just means the precipitation that falls in the form of snow never melts, but there's very little precipitation in any given year. Now, you can also have different controls of the climate that give you different types of, of weather patterns. For instance, in San Francisco, we have this a precipitation maximum in the winter. November, December, January, February, and then much, much drier conditions in the summer. And then in uh, Kansas City, Missouri, in Kansas, we have a maximum in the summertime. That's when we have precipitation mostly coming in the summertime, and then less of it in the winter. And then somewhere more like Baltimore, where you have precipitation all year long. So the average annual precipitation across North America it, is, uh, varies. Uh, in these different cities. So why do these three cities at the same latitude have very, very different climates? If you just looked at the three cell model where you have the warm, humid climate at the equator and then you get cooler as you move north with the 
Uh, the subtropical high pressure bringing drier air at 30 degrees north and then more rainfall up at 60 degrees. If you just went by that three cell model, you might expect that there actually would, uh, would be the same climates at each latitude. There'd be bands of climates that went across the earth north and south from the equator. But the reality is, as we can see, these three cities not only have different temperature regimes, but they also have different precipitation regimes. And the reason why is still the effect of the three cell model, but in this case, the three cell model creates these semi-permanent areas of high pressure, these subtropical highs. And over here on uh, the Atlantic side, let me see if I can, over here on the Atlantic side, on uh, the Pacific side that is, our subtropical high is moving clockwise around the Pacific Ocean. There's our high pressure, right? And then over here on the Atlantic side, our high pressure is moving clockwise, clockwise around the Atlantic Ocean. And what we know about high pressure is high pressure means the air is sinking. The air is sinking toward the ground, and that should provide us with fair weather. But the sinking, that subsidence, is much more pronounced on the eastern side of the dome of high pressure because this is a wind from north to south. This wind from north to south means that this air is going to sink in, in a much more pronounced way than the air on the western side of an area of high pressure. And so it's the same thing in the Pacific. Over here, there's less sinking on the west side. In the Atlantic, there's certainly more sinking over here on the east side. But as far as North America it goes, California is certainly going to be cooler, and California is certainly going to have a different precipitation pattern because the sinking air along the California current brings cool air and a very, very, very dry summer. Whereas in the wintertime, winter storms coming in along the 60 degree north latitude line does bring some rainfall. On the other side of the continent, because there is much less sinking, much less subsidence on the west side of the area of high pressure, you have a bit more lift. Well, two things are happening. This south-southeast wind is coming from a very warm and humid area. So it brings a very warm and humid air mass in which gives you a nice pronounced summertime pattern of precipitation in Kansas City, and then a year-round pattern of precipitation over here in the, uh, the Baltimore area. And again, it's a function of these two cells of high pressure. They are part of the larger three-cell model, but these individual mesoscale cells of high pressure have different effects on either side of the continent. And again, this southerly flow means warmer air in the southeast, and this northerly flow means colder air air here, and I made this, said this before, Mark Twain once said the coldest winter he ever spent was one summer in San Francisco because of this sinking air and this north flow and the north current of the California current making things chilly and very, very dry in San Francisco, where at the same latitude, at the same time, over here in Baltimore, it's much warmer and it's also much, much wetter. So here's one of those localized climate effects. The prevailing wind comes off the Pacific Ocean. Uh, just to the east of the Olympic Mountains. So we got Seattle uh, is over here in the Olympic mount Mountains. And the wind comes in off the ocean. And when the wind blows up that mountainside, we call that what? Orographic lift. And that orographic lift creates some pretty significant precipitation uh, in this region of the Olympic Mountains. But remember when we showed you the rain shadow effect, as, those, as that wind goes up the mountains, yeah, you get lift in condensation cloud formation and precipitation, but as the, as the air comes back down those mountains, it warms at the dry adiabatic lobstrate and it dries the air out. And just inland from those mountains, you get this very low precipitation. So this particular region of the world may be in that band, which you should have wet conditions all year long, but because of more mesoscale or more localized climate controls, you may have some variations to contend with. And this is the effect of topography on average annual precipitation along a line running from the Pacific Ocean through, the Central Cali through Central California into the western Nevada. And again, it's the same situation. In Central California, the wind comes off the Pacific Ocean, up the mountains near Santa Cruz, and you get some rainfall. The air cools at the dry adiabatic lapse rate, and then the moist adiabatic lapse rate, dumping its moisture, and then comes back down the mountain, warming at the dry adiabatic lapse rate, warming up, lowering the relative humidity, and drying things out. And then past San Jose in the Central Valley, and it goes back up the mountains to Mount Hamilton, and you get precipitation again. And then this air comes back down, and it's drier. Well, the air, this blue arrow, has, we'll say, X amount of moisture in it, 
Now you have less than that amount here. You're still getting precipitation and even less than that amount here. But by the time you have uplift over the coastal range, uplift over the Cascades, and then uplift over the Sierra, this air is completely dried out. And as that air comes back down into Nevada, there's just no moisture left to create any type of cloud cover. And you have very little precipitation. Again, mountain ranges being a climate control, disrupting the zonal climate that we see north to south in the equator. Uh, and creating its own smaller scale climates, maybe mesoscale climates, uh, based on those mountain ranges themselves. Now, all these variations and all these differences in climate um, can be confusing. And as I've said uh, before in this class, scientists want to classify things. So scientists wanted to classify climate. And one scientist who didn't have necessarily climatological data from all over the world uh, thought about classifying climate areas based on the vegetation in those areas. They wanted to relate vegetation to climate to predict the climate types without actually having climatological data. And that man's name was um, Valdemir Keppen. And in 1980, 1918, that is 1918, created the Keppen system of climate classification. And largely the Keppen system of climate classification is still used, although modified, uh, and modified to some degree, but still used today. And in the Keppen climate classification system, uh, we have these five generalized climates that are then broken down into much, to smaller subclimates, and in some cases, several la layers of smaller subclimates. But the generalized climates are tropical moist climates, dry climates, moist mid-latitude climates with mild winters, moist mid-latitude climates with severe winters, and then your polar climates. So a simplified view of the major climate types according to Keppen along with the climate controls. So we have large highs and large lows in the map that represent the average position of the semi-permanent high and low pressure areas. The solid red lines, these solid red lines here represent the location of the intertropical convergence zone in January and then in in July, and in the northern hemisphere in July, it's displaced, it's displaced further north because this area gets hotter. And in January, it's displaced further south because uh, in the southern hemisphere, this is uh, in January, it's summertime, and it get, that, that line gets to play, displaced further south. We also see the ocean currents like the warm Gulf Stream current, the cold California current, um, the cold uh, Bangla current. Um, and, and several other ocean currents that are here in, in blue and red. So again, this all goes back to that three scale, that three cell model of the global circulation, which is at the equator, air rises, and then it sinks back down at 30 degrees north latitude, where it sinks, it strikes the earth, it spreads out, and in the northern hemisphere goes clockwise, and in the southern hemisphere goes counterclockwise, creating belts of high pressure, and of course belts of high pressure resulting in drier air, the Sonoran Desert, the Sahara Desert, the Arabian Desert, the Tibetan Plateau, uh, the Turkestan Desert, the Gobi Desert, and then at 30 degrees south latitude, the Patagonia Desert, uh, the Kalan Desert, and then also the, um, the Nambian Desert, and the Australian Desert, all at that 30 degrees north and south latitude because air rises at the ITCZ and of course what do we have there near the equator at the ITCZ we have the world's massive rainforest in Brazil and the Amazon River and the massive rain areas that feed a the Nile but also the Congo right in here is the Congo and then of course you don't think of Indonesia as being dry no it's always wet and rainy right along the equator so this is the belt of low pressure created by thermal lift but also remember that's your northeast trade wind this is your southeast trade wind those trade winds are doing what they're converging air is converging right along the tropics and where air converges at the surface it's forced to rise so rising air in this region results in rain sinking air 30 degrees north 30 degrees south results in drier climate and then just south of 60 just north of 60 we get the cold polar air coming in from the north, cold polar air coming in from the south, and we get that polar front right along here, which then generates a moist, and we see it in purple, the moist climate. So the Keppen classification system has our tropical areas where it's wet near the ITCZ, the dry areas in yellow along 30 degrees north and 30 degrees south, 
the moist, mild uh, winters, well, of course, in the southeast are moist and mild, most of Western Europe, and then the moist, severe winters, those up to the north, up near Canada, and northern parts of Canada, and Alaska, and then Siberia, and then, of course, the polar areas north and south, and then mountains make up their own climate classification because mountains don't fall into any of these ranges and so wherever you have a mountain range the Andes the Rockies the Sierra Nevada uh, any of these other mountain ranges in through Europe they create their own separate climate classification so essentially the book will go through these in detail break many of them down into the the sub sets and give you lots and lots of different types of of uh, well pictures of those climates and also uh, charts of those climates to give you sort of a better understanding of of what's happening uh, in this lecture what we want to do is try and go through the general the generalization of these climates and uh, give you a generalized understanding uh, in this class introduction to meteorology was just sort of scraping the edge of this we're not getting deep into it you can take deep deep climate uh, studies and study it for four years there's much to be learned about the climate so the first uh, Keppen classification system is the A's, and the A's are tropical moist climates, and of course year-round warm temperatures and abundant rainfall. They tend to extend northward and southward from the equator to about 15 to 25 degrees north or south latitude, so believe it or not, Central Florida is not in a tropical moist climate, or in a slightly different climate. Three major types, there's a tropical wet, a tropical monsoon, and a tropical wet and dry. And of course the tropical wet um, you have very small seasonable temperatures. The noonday sun is always high. Uh, the number of daylight hours is relatively constant. Um, and uh, you have a pretty big variation between your daytime and your high time high and, and, and daytime and lows at night. Um, and you have um, a lot of humidity and a lot of rainfall and a lot of cloud cover. And uh, it's, a, it's a moist climate, tropical um, wet climate, AF. Tropical monsoon uh, AM is a little bit different where the monthly precipitation totals drop uh, in certain times of the year so here in the in the AM the tropical monsoon uh, yearly rainfall totals are similar to those of the tropical wet they're they're pretty high but because there's a, a brief dry season and then very very heavy rain throughout the rest of the year we call it this monsoon a monsoon as you recall from I think chapter seven is a seasonal reversal of winds that results in an onshore flow bringing rain and offshore flow bringing dry and a very brief dry season is in this tropical monsoon and then lastly there's the tropical wet and dry so just north of the tropical wet regions um, you have a gradual transition in the tropical wet and dry climate where you have a distinct dry season and a distinct wet season and you get that tropical uh, tropical wet and dry all right, the dry climates, and again, our dry climates are going to be at about 30 degrees north and 30 degrees south latitude. Uh, not a whole lot of precipitation most of the year, um, and typically the potential evaporation and transpiration. Evaporation is liquid water evaporating. Transpiration is when it comes out of plants. That's going to exceed precipitation. You're going to lose more water than you're going to get. You're going to have a dry, uh, a dry climate. Uh, extends... The subtropical deserts, roughly 20 and 30 degrees uh, in, in latitude, and very large continental regions in the mid-latitudes, um, and oftentimes they're surrounded by mountains. And there's actually two types. You have a BW and a BS, where the BW is just dry, arid, 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 arid. And then you have the uh, BS, which is the, uh, the semi-arid, uh, not, quite, not quite as dry. You may have a little bit of rainfall here and there, um, and uh, that was going to be your um, your dry climate semi-arid all right then as you move north you start getting into those moist subtropical to mid-latitude climates so this the, the tropics are maybe to 15 degrees 20 degrees north latitude maybe 25 and then from 25 to 40 maybe 50 you're somewhere between the subtropical and the mid-latitudes and uh, you generally have these climates uh, where you're talking about humid but mild winters so you have humid conditions, plenty of rainfall, but the winters are not too crazily wet, right? And you have humid subtropical CFA, um, humid marine, and humid Mediterranean. And the differences are just very slightly different. The first one is the humid subtropical, um, and they're found principally along the east coast of continents, like where we are, we're in a humid subtropical. 
um, and between 25 and 40 degrees latitude, north or south. Uh, they dominate the southeastern section of the United States, like I said, where we are, eastern China, southern Japan, on the southern hemisphere, they're found on the southeastern side of South America. Uh, and so uh, a trademark of the humid subtropical climate is those hot, <clears throat> muggy summers, and then that gives way to winters that tend to be a little bit drier, but with passing cold fronts, you do actually get uh, some showers and thunderstorms. The other two types is the marine uh, moist subtropical and the Mediterranean moist subtropical, uh, and those are just really slightly different based on their location. And again, the book will go into those in, in real deep detail. Uh, you can get more information on those. Then there's the moist continental climate. So this is group D. So again, what we were just looking at was the, um, uh, the group C. Our group B was the dry, group A was the tropical, group C was the moist subtropical mid-latitude climates. Now we're up to group D, and now we're talking to warm to cool summers, and not like hot summers, and cold winters, and severe winters with snowstorms, and blustery winds, and bitter cold. And, and typically these are in the middle of large continents, and they, uh, their extent is north of the moist subtropical mid-latitude climates up to the poles. And there's several types of those as well. There's humid continental with hot summers, humid continental with cool summers, and then what they refer to as subpolar. So um, these moist continental climates uh, definitely see very, very bitter cold conditions, but there are some general differences in what you might find um, based on their actual latitude, based on how far they are away from an ocean, um, and uh, based on whether they're close to mountain ranges or not. So the, the, the fourth is going to be the moist continental climates, Group D. And then the last one, well, actually, there's one after this, which is the highlands, but the last one in, in the um, in terms of stripes along the globe, are the polar climates. And of course, year-round low temperatures, um, and we're talking about the North Pole and South Pole, and you either have tundra or ice caps. And again, these actually make up some of the world's great deserts because there's so little precipitation. And then the group H is the highland. Uh, and this, ref as I said, refers to something sometimes you call altitudinal zonation, where as you go up in altitude, you actually see a, a change in climate. Um, so you don't actually have to visit the North Pole to get a polar climate. Because temperature, as you know, goes down as you increase the altitude. For every 1,000 feet you go up, you're going to see a drop in temperature. It, it's sort of like going up in latitude as well. As a matter of fact, because temperature does decrease with height, if you climb about 300 meters, it's equivalent in higher latitudes. It's equivalent to a change of about 185 miles moving north. So what, what that means is if you go up 300 meters or about 1,000 feet, it's very similar to traveling north 300 kilometers or about 185 miles. And that's about three degrees of latitude. So just by going up 1,000 feet, in terms of the temperature you're gonna feel, it's like moving north three degrees of latitude. In addition, we know that as the air moves up over this mountain, as it's moving up over this mountain, that as air is forced to rise, it's gonna cool, as we know, by, uh, by expansion uh, until it reaches its dew point, the temperature reaches its dew point, and then you're going to get the cloud formation and precipitation. So as the air rises along the windward side of the mountain, precipitation amounts are going to increase. Down here, you may not have cooled it enough to get precipitation, but as you cool that air going up, you're going to get more and more precipitation. And, and so you're going to get this change from maybe a savanna or a grassland, which is a drier climate, to a chaparral, some smaller trees, it requires a little bit more rainfall. And then you get this mixed forest, which requires uh, the highest amount of rainfall. And then as you get higher and higher north, it, uh, up, I should say, higher, it's like going north, but as you get higher and higher up the mountain, it gets colder and colder, more and more difficult for, uh, for plant life to live. Eventually, you get to the tree line where any further higher, it's too cold for trees to survive. And then eventually, you may even get to a point where you have nothing but rocks on top. And if moisture continues to get pushed up, you may get an ice cap or snowfall. But if it's cold enough up here, you may get a permanent ice cap on top of that. So highland climates are uh, in sort of a class by themselves. You're going to find highland climates, highland climates on any continent where you have you have mountains. And on those mountains, no matter what the climate is around the mountain, uh, you're going to find uh, a different climate going up that mountain because of the highland nature. And a pretty good example of that uh, would be um, down in South America. Right along the coastline, they have a maritime environment, um, a little bit of moisture, you know, maybe mild conditions. Uh, and then as you go up the Andes, you, you get these highland climates very, very quickly. And then you go down the other side of the Andes, 
and you get into the east side of the continent and you get the very, very warm, humid conditions. And so you go from being a, a cool, dry maritime to highland, maybe even an ice cap, and then, um, and then warm, humid conditions in the Amazon area, all along the same latitude and in a very short distance of time because of that mountain that is in between the two. And basically, the summary on this course uh, is uh, on this uh, particular chapter is that you have your tropical climates found in low latitudes where you always have high noonday sun, lots of heat, day and night are pretty much equal. Um, most of the months are warm. There's no real winter season, your tropical climates. And then you're going to have your dry climates. Of course, the tropical is going to be 15 to 25 degrees on either side of the equator. Uh, then those dry climates are going to be that 20 to 40 degrees on either side of the equator, those, those uh, subtropical highs where evaporation and transpiration exceed precipitation, so it's going to be fairly dry. And then north of those dry subtropical high pressure zones right around 30 degrees north or 30 degrees south, whether it's north of that zone or south of that zone in the southern hemisphere, you have the mid-latitudes. And the mid-latitudes where you're going to have a distinct winter and a distinct summer season. So th think about maybe Wichita, Kansas or Knoxville, Tennessee, maybe even up into Chicago. Definitely have a winter time. They know it and they also have a summer season. And then as you get further and further north, those summers become much cooler and your winters become much, much harsher. And those mid-latitudes are divided into the mild winter and then the extreme winter, and then once you get past the extreme winter with a distinct mid, uh, distinct winter and summer season, you get up into the polar regions, and of course the polar regions is where you're going to find it cold pretty much year-round. So that pretty much wraps up chapter 12. Again, this discussion of global climate, we are really looking at just the smallest scale. We're really just scratching the surface. Climate is something that you can study for a four-year degree, for a master's degree or for a PhD, there is much, much, much more to learn about the subtle intricacies of climate. But this is just sort of an introduction to climate and basically giving you that overarching understanding of those larger scale features that can control the climates of smaller regions and in some cases vast and, and very large regions. So the next chapter, chapter 13, is the Earth's changing climate. And we need to take a look at the Earth's climate from two different perspectives. The first perspective being the fact that over the last 4.5 to 4.6 billion years, the Earth's climate has changed. It's changed regularly and all on its own, starting with an atmosphere of hydrogen and helium, and then second, an atmosphere that had no oxygen and no ozone, and then last, a, a, an atmosphere with that oxygen and ozone that allowed for life to exist on the surface of planet Earth. In addition to those significant global changes, we have to look at a change in temperatures that we've seen, a warmer Earth, a much, much colder Earth, different sea levels, and we can see how different processes will force different types of global climate. The next perspective, of course, is going to be the perspective on man and the anthropogenic impacts, man's impact on climate and climate change. Are we having an effect? Could we actually affect the Earth's climate? And what does that mean for this potential global warming. And that's going to wrap up not only chapter 13, the Earth's changing climate, but that will also wrap up this course as well. So we'll see you next time with chapter 13, the Earth's changing climate.